Mo, thanks very much for coming in. Thank you in. very much. Appreciate it. Please Thank have you. a seat. Prostate cancer and testosterone. I can't think of a more controversial topic that has been in the news, been in all the medical journals. So give us a brief update on what you think the world of testosterone and prostate cancer is at the present time. Jerry, first, you know, this has been such a controversial topic since 1941 when they said that testosterone causes prostate cancer. It was based on one patient. And if you look at what's going on in the past 20 years, we've had this whole paradigm shift. First, we said, is it dangerous? Then we said it's safe. And now there's data on potentially therapeutic or actually preventative for prostate cancer. And I think one of the most interesting things we're seeing now at Johns Hopkins University is that, do you know how they treat metastatic prostate cancer? They give men high doses of testosterone to treat metastatic prostate cancer. Total reversal of approach. Total reversal of what we're thinking. So again, right. I think there's a lot more to the story. I do personally believe that um, hypogonadal patients are at a greater risk for getting prostate cancer. And I think it's very important to counsel patients after radical prostatectomy that testosterone may be beneficial in the recovery of erectile function. So incredibly controversial, but I understand that there's some evidence if you have a low testosterone, you're hypogonadal, you may, may be at more risk for a high-grade cancer as well. So true. Not only do men with low testosterone levels are at greater risk for having high-grade cancer, they're more at greater risk for having biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy, more common to have positive surgical margins after radical prostatectomy. So low T is a risk factor for prostate cancer, completely the opposite of what we thought in the past. Amazing. And so the man who comes to you who um, thinks he has low testosterone, how common is low testosterone in the general population? Very important. So 39% of men over the age of 45, 39% will have low testosterone values. Not, not all of them will be symptomatic, right? So remember that if you have to you suffer from this condition, you have to have low testosterone and you have to be symptomatic. Right. Both, both. Okay. And is the prostate cancer patient population at a greater risk for low T? Yes, so that's really important you mentioned that. So we know it's the chicken or the egg. Does low T cause prostate cancer or does prostate cancer cause low T? We know there's an association. Some interesting studies have shown that when you do a radical prostatectomy and remove the prostate cancer, the testosterone values go up, suggesting maybe the prostate cancer has an inhibitory effect on the testosterone. Now I want to be very clear, you mentioned something important. The AUA guidelines in 2018 make it very clear that patients should be informed that testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. But the second bullet underneath that states that the risk-benefit ratio giving testosterone to a man after radical prostatectomy is still unknown. And so to be fair, we still do need more studies in that area. So that brings up a really critical clinical question. How do you manage that guy who's been treated for prostate cancer and is symptomatic and tested and found to have low testosterone? Great question, shared decision making. It's all about the counseling. You have to let them know what does the data suggest, what do the guidelines say. And I will tell you though that most urologists, if you look at surveys from the past 10 years, have shown that their comfort level in giving testosterone to men after radical prostatectomy is greater. Despite what the guidelines say, more and more urologists feel that comfortable prescribing testosterone after radical prostatectomy, but you have to counsel and let the patient know what you're doing. That's a real change in practice patterns, isn't it? I mean, I'm an old guy, but I remember when I was in a resident in urology, it was absolutely contraindicated. And then there was a transition where we started to think about doing it. And now you're saying most uh, physicians who are up to date on the, on the information are comfortable with it. Yeah, so a nice survey that came out to urologists out of Canada, and they surveyed all the urologists, and they found that 86% of urologists had no problem giving men testosterone after radiation. Over 90% of the urologists had no trouble giving men testosterone after radical prostatectomy. And it was interesting, a third of them actually were very comfortable giving men testosterone on active surveillance. So the paradigm has shifted. But I will tell you, Jerry, that in my opinion, a man after radical prostatectomy who's hypogonadal is a significant disadvantage in recovering his erectile function compared to a eugonadal man. So in our practice, we try to get that medication on early. Excellent. Tell us uh, from a very practical standpoint, the man comes to see you after his prostate cancer surgery. Um, what is the time frame? How do you monitor him uh, in terms of his testosterone and PSA? Right, so there's no standard. So I will only s or cite, we had an FDA approved clinical trial that was approved and the FDA at that time let me treat patients who had a Gleason 3 plus 4 or lower and two undetectable PSAs within the first three months. So that's something to hang my hat on and say, okay, this has been shown before. So clearly in that population, 
and we have no problem in giving these patients testosterone. I like to get it on early, before six months, because I think that window is short. Um, so, we, but with proper counseling uh, and meeting certain criteria, undetectable PSAs at least two within the first three months, we do feel like it's appropriate to treat these patients with testosterone. Fantastic information, Mo. Thanks for coming in My today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.